Well, welcome to our class on the study of the apocalypse. This is episode 14. We did not finish everything we wanted to say last, last episode on chapter 11 in the manual. So we're going to begin there with the chapter 11, part two, and I'm hopeful we'll be able to make it all the way through all of chapter 12 in the manual and put us back on schedule. I have decided, uh, one, to save my voice, and secondly, uh, out of necessity, I don't know that it's required. Uh, last week I read major portions out of uh, the book of Revelation before we use the Jewish commentators to comment on it. Uh, and if you're watching this on video, obviously you could have your Bible there and I could tell you we're going to read chapter 6 and begin with verse 1 uh, where we start today. And you could then pause the tape and read... Uh, let's see, how far would we go? Golly, through verse 17. So, Revelation chapter 6, verses 1 through 17. Now, those of you watching us live at this moment, we won't have time to go turn to that. But I have chosen not to read those 17 verses in our video session together. So, again, if you're watching us live right now, you'll have to come back and read the part out of Revelation yourself. If you're watching this on video, then you will be able to stop us at this point and for yourself, get your Bible and read the book of Revelation, chapter 6, 1 through 17. And having done so, which is about in, in this seal, the the beginning of the book of the prophecy that's going to be eaten and devoured. We begin then with our Jewish comments on these verses in chapter 6 of the book of Revelation. At the opening of the first seal by the Messiah, this is written by the Jewish commentators, so they mean their Jewish understanding of a political messiah. The seer hears the thunder call of one of the four Hayat and sees a white horse appear with a rider holding a bow representing probably pestilence at the opening of the second seal. A red horse with a rider armed with a great sword representing war and at the opening of the third seal, a black horse with a rider holding a pair of balances to weigh out flour and bread, having become scarce, signifying upon the earth's famine. And at the opening of the fourth seal, a pale horse, the rider thereof being dead. These four horses and horsemen are often referred to as the four horsemen of the apocalypse. And these four are to destroy one fourth part of the earth by sword, famine, pestilence, and wild beasts. What plague is ushered in, I'm quoting the Jewish commentators, in at the opening of the fifth seal, these were the first seals here, is no longer stated. Apparently, uh, it is the persecution of the saints, as the text continues. I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony they gave as martyrs. And you can see there the Jewish references to the Kedush HaShem. As I said last time, I, I barely speak English. Uh, I, I, I mispronounce Greek, I mispronounce German, I mispronounce Latin, and it's obvious I mispronounce Hebrew as well. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, 
How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them? This is the martyr speaking. On them that dwell on the earth, and white robes were given them, and they were told to rest <coughs> for a while until the number of martyrs was full. You can compare this with the apocalypse of Baruch and in 4th Ezra. After this, the seer beholds a great multitude of people of every land and language, both Jews and proselytes, also arrayed in white robes, standing before the throne. And he is told, the seer is told, that having undergone great tribulation, they have made their robes white by the blood of the martyrs, of course not of the Lamb, as the Christian reviser has it, and that now they serve God in the heavenly temple day and night. The Shekinah dwells with them, and you could see Revelation 7, verse 9 through 17, which part is misplaced according to the scholars and belongs here. And then I have it next in your text where we began, we've inserted 9 through 17 of the martyrs there speaking. And after that passage of the worship there day and night in the midst of the Shekinah, the Jewish commentators continue in chapter 6, 12 through 17, at the opening of the sixth seal, the birth throes of the Messianic time appear, as depicted in Joel chapter 3, Isaiah chapter 2, chapter 34, and Hosea chapter 10. Fear of the great day of God's wrath, see Malachi 3, and the wrath of his anointed, see Psalm chapter 2, will seize the whole world. We could add our own comments at this point. The events associated with the sixth seal are depicted in cataclysmic terms for the known world, which in the first century extended across the Roman Empire from Spain all the way eastward through Mesopotamia to India. This was the area essentially occupied by the Jewish diaspora. Many Christians in the West, particularly those reading the New Testament from a Protestant perspective, often read from the perspective of the Jewish Old Testament's understanding of God as an angry, wrathful, and judgmental God, hardly able to control himself from exterminating the human race. Of course, the Gospels reveal a different understanding of God the Creator as the only lover of mankind. It is out of love for the world that the incarnation occurs. God did not become flesh to condemn the world, but to rescue the world from itself. Tragedy, both personal and global, often causes us to pause and re-examine ourselves. The issue is not that God is punishing us. Sometimes what we call punishment is simply the outcome, the consequence of a particular set of behavior or lifestyle. As for widespread natural disasters, floods, tsunamis, tornadoes, earthquakes, hurricanes, or global medical crises, 
such as the Black Death, the Spanish flu, and of course now the COVID-19 pandemic. As for all such disasters, Jesus taught that God created the sun to shine on the evil and the good, and for the rain to fall on both the righteous and the unrighteous. Rather than blame God when negative things happen, let us personally use the opportunity to quietly reassess our own lives, our priorities, and our relationship with our family as we reassess, reassess our relationship with God. We then come to Revelation, the seventh chapter, sealing of the 14,000, 144,000, uh, before the seventh seal is open. We've already looked at 9 through 17, and so we would become then what was left and bring us to chapter 8 of the book of Revelation, the opening of the seventh seal and the beginning of the first four trumpets. They would be found in Revelation chapter 8, verses 1 through, and then you'll see in your manual, we're going to insert Revelation chapter 7, verses 1 through, what, uh, 8, that we skipped in the last section because they belong here. And so we're going to start with 8, 1, then we're going to insert the portion we just moved from chapter 7, and then we will pick up with 8, 2, all the way through 8, 6. As the Jewish commentators reconstruct the original sequence of this Jewish apocalypse. And then they comment, the opening of the seventh seal forms the climax, the awful catastrophe is marked in, by silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. The four angels that hold the winds at the four corners of the earth are told to check the blowing of the winds, whether on land, sea, and in the trees, until angels an angel has sealed upon the forehead with the seal of the living God, the 144,000 servants of God that represent 12,000 of each of the 12 tribes of Israel. Dan, the tribe of Dan as an idolater is excluded. Levi takes his place along with the two sons of Joseph, half-tribes to equal the one tribe, in order to guard them against the impending destruction that was given in Revelation chapter 7, 1 through 8, that was inserted. The Jewish scholars then comment on the seven trumpets. I know I'm going quickly, but I'm just wanting you to see it's a Jewish document, so we don't have to try to get involved inside the Jewish understanding of their own document. It was understandable in the first century to the uh, Christian Jews as well as the rabbinic Jews. Both sets of the Jews knew all of this and understood it. The seven trumpets of the seven angels before God usher in seven great calamities. The first four involve a world conflagration, Mabul Shalesh, that burns up the third part of the land, dries up a third part of the sea and the rivers. There will be an eclipse of sun, moon, and stars. You may compare that with the Sibyllines in chapter 3, 80 through 90, and 80 and then 90 through 5540. 
The remaining three are announced by an angel that is flying through the midst of heaven. And then that brings us, all of this scene then moves to chapter 9, where we have the angels flying through heaven. And we will have then the seventh seal and the trumpet, trumpet sounding number 5 and 6 taking place. And so in chapter 9, you can see I'm moving just quickly through this. Chapter 9, verse 1, and again, if you're watching on video, take the time, stop, and read this. 1 through 12. And then these Jewish commentators say the following. The remaining three angels just described which were announced by an angel flying through the midst of heaven at the end of Revelation 8. The Jewish comments continue. The remaining three are announced by an angel flying through the midst of heaven that bring even greater woes. First, the torment of locusts in Revelation 9, 1 through 12 described in all its fierceness in the apocalyptic chapters of Joel, chapter 1, 2, and 2 through 9, coming forth from the abyss over which the angel Abaddon, destruction, you may compare that with Job 28, or with Zephoni and Joel 2, 20, Zakut Talmud, and alone uh, as well, which alone has power in Revelations 9. Then you have the sixth trumpet that's going to sound in Revelation chapter 9, verse 13, and the coming of the second woe, which is all the way through from 913 through, golly, 921. You can see how we're having to just stop, read, stop, read, and the comments on all of this. And the Jewish comments then comment on this. Secondly, they say, the letting loose from the banks of the Euphrates of the four kings, and they give the language there uh, written in Hebrew, which is trans should be translated kings and not angels, Note the only difference in the spelling of the two Jewish words is the Aleph uh, inserted in the third slot, uh, come, counting from the right-hand side. You can see the Aleph kind of looks like an X uh, that is inserted. Makes the difference between the word king and the word angel. Uh, the four kings with a numberless host of wild Parthian horsemen wearing breastplates of fire and brimstone and riding on horses that have heads of lions, tails of serpents, and out of whose mouths come fire and smoke and brimstone. Uh, I, I think Tolkien used the book of Revelation to create some of the Lord of the Ring uh, creatures that we see in his story. As with the former plagues, a third part of mankind is killed. They were prepared for this task from the, from the beginning of the world, and yet closes the seer, the seer is going to now close the passage, that the rest of the men which were not killed repented not, but continued to worship Demons, idols of gold and silver, bronze, stone, wood, practice witchcraft, and commit murders, fornications, and thefts. We can see chapter 9. We can see the Sibyllines, chapter 2, chapter 4, and the verses are there. And you can compare the four kings of the mighty host upon the banks of the Euphrates in the Midrash of Simeon, Ben Yohi in Yelenik, and you've got the citations there. Now let us make our personal comments. The Jewish concept of God as an, a God of judgment 
includes an understanding of God as an enforcer of a strict moral code. Within this Jewish framework, plagues and natural disasters are not only understood as God's punishment of immoral mankind, but they also have the additional purpose of getting mankind's attention, which results in mankind's repentance with a resulting change in, first, their behavior, and be their turning of mankind from the worship of idols to the worship of the true God. But these apocalyptic plagues do not achieve that purpose as mankind did not, does not repent. Uh, for those that want to say COVID-19 is the punishment of God, it may be true that for the moment the world pauses and maybe hears that message, maybe questions itself, but I assure you as soon as this moment in history passed, uh, it'll be business uh, as normal again in the secular culture in which we now live. Punishment does not, it may get our attention, it does not change our behavior. This Jewish understanding of an angry, judgmental God shows God is justified in destroying mankind by the fact that by not destroying all mankind in the first place, even those destroyed still do not repent. The non-repentance of mankind, therefore, in an Old Testament Jewish apocalyptic frame of mind, somehow justifies God's destruction of all mankind. Which brings us then to chapter 10 of the book of Revelation, which contains the book with the seven seals in it, before the seventh trumpet is sounded. The Jewish scholars see chapters 10, 1 through 11, uh, 1 through chapter 11, 13, as material that has been misplaced and inadvertently or accidentally misplaced here. The notes in the Orthodox Study Bible agree with this Jewish assessment, saying 10.1 through 11.13 is a parenthesis between the six and the seven trumpets. Therefore, we shall postpone the discussion of these interlude chapters until later which brings us to chapter 11, beginning in verse 14, all the way through verse 19. The Jewish comments on this third and last woe. The third and last woe that was announced in 1114, remember we've had the f interruption of 10 uh, and, and 11 up to here is no longer given in what follows in 1115 for the Christian reviser changes the text which originally described the last judgment passed upon the non-repentant people that we've just seen. The kingdoms of this world instead now speak of the kingdoms having become the kingdoms of Christ. Only verse 18, telling of the wrath of God that has come upon the nations that shall be destroyed as they have destroyed the land, 
contains traces of the formal contents of this chapter. Notice this. The original content of this chapter was about the damnation of the kingdoms of this earth, and the Christianized version doesn't have the damnation of the kingdoms of this earth, but that the kingdoms of this earth have become the kingdoms of God. Uh, they're transformed, not punished. It is possible that 14, 1 through 5, referring to the 144,000 of Israel that had been saved and the proclamation to all the nations to fear God and worship Him, for the hour of His judgment has come, form part of this original Jewish apocalypse, as did chapter 9, 6 through 18. You can piece that all together if you want to scissor and paste it to try to get what this original apocalypse looked like. You have there in your um, pages the uh, references to the 24 elders before God and the vision of the reappearance of the Ark of the Covenant in 11, verse 11, chapter 11, 19, that you could compare with the Jewish Yoma and the references there. Well, our comments. It is outside our purpose to attempt to reconstruct and patch together all these misplaced verses into their original order. However, when the seventh angel sounded, the seventh trumpet is assumed, but isn't mentioned, and the third woe was actually described as identified in the Jewish comments above, the whole section of Revelation chapter 4 through chapter 11, 18, minus the Christian insurgents, the apocalypse of the seven seals, this first apocalyptic part, has reached its conclusion. We've said there is the original part of the apocalypse, the letters to the seven churches, written by the Apostle John. And then there was a shift to this Jewish apocalyptic section that was comprised primarily of two separate apocalypses. One up to the destruction of Jerusalem and that war uh, between the Jews and Rome. And now that apocalypse has come to an end and we are about to take up the second apocalypse in the remaining chapters. So the conclusion then to the apocalypse of the seven seals, that's this whole section after the seven letters that now comes an apocalypse that we call the Apocalypse of the Seven Seals. As previously mentioned, in all probability, this apocalypse was written before the destruction of Jerusalem at a time of persecution when many Jews died as martyrs, though many others yielded. Hence, only 12,000 of each tribe are to be selected. Jewish historian Josephus reported that the first Jewish war that led to the annihilation of Jerusalem resulted in the death of 1.1 million Jews and the destruction of the Jewish temple in 70 A.D. 1.1 million Jews will die in that war. The relationship between Jewish nationalism 
and Jewish apocalypticism must be considered. Apocalypticism, when do we ride to Jerusalem? When, come on, get your sword, let's go, the Messiah's coming, he needs us to help him. Apocalypticism fueled nationalism by promising victory through the intervention of God in history. In the same way Hollywood movies have a commander give a fiery speech to his soldiers before they charge into battle, or the same way a football coach gives a Newt Rockne speech to win one for the Gipper before the big football game, in that same way, Jewish apocalypticism fired up Jewish nationalism to rebel against the Romans and win one for the Messiah. John's parishes, the seven churches of Asia, had both Jewish Christians and Gentile God-fearers as members. The Jewish Christians brought with them their Jewish nationalistic pride and perhaps latent hostility towards Roman dominion and domination. Even the God-fearers, in an effort to be Jewish-friendly, or more Jewish than the Jews, may have adopted similar pro-Jewish and anti-Roman biases. The use of the Jewish apocalyptic genre does not suggest nor imply an endorsement of Jewish nationalism or anti-Roman antagonism on the part of the Apostle John. The fact John uses these apocalyptic documents in and of itself does not authorize or say that John agreed with that apocalypticism or that anti-Romanism. Quite the contrary. As we shall see in our part three, the mystagogic apocalypse, the apocalypse as a Christian document stands as a warning against apocalypticism in general and against political nationalism and political rebellion in the name of God. The evidence of Christian revision and redaction makes the Jewish document being used more easily acceptable to a pro-apocalyptic bias inside John's parishes. There has to be a point of identity and recognition on behalf of the laity, maybe even the clergy, in those parishes, so that when they read it, John can begin to give them the true revelation. Having the attention of his parishes the apocalypse quietly transforms attention away from earthly kingdoms and socio-political causes to the eternal kingdom of God. The Jewish apocalypse of the seven seals had encouraged nationalistic fervor, and rebellion in support of the Jewish insurrection that began in Judea in 66 AD. John uses 
the same apocalypse in 95 AD after the complete destruction of Jerusalem, the Jewish temple, and the death of over one million rebellious Jews and halfway to the ultimate defeat of nationalistic Judaism in 136 AD. We've just had round one beginning in 66, and we're going to have the second and final knockout round 70 years later in 136, and John's living and writing in between round one and round two. John is writing to show that Christian eschatology, the Christian understanding of God in history, is not apocalyptic. It is not nationalistic. It is not political. And it has nothing to do with the kingdoms of this world. It is in John's gospel that Jesus tells Pilate, my kingdom is not of this world. In part three, mystagogic apocalypse, we shall discuss the Christian eschatological understanding of the prophecy of the uncut stone in the book of Daniel. At this point in his apocalypse, John is reminding his Christian parishes of the futility and the failure of Jewish apocalyptic thinking. The editorial insertion of Christian metaphors did not Christianize Jewish apocalypticism and somehow make apocalypticism now authentic and acceptable. It is only when you have a Jewish Old Testament in your Bible instead of the original Old Testament in your Bible that this begins to this Jewish system begins to creep back in to Christianity in the West. The apocalypse does not baptize or Christianize Jewish apocalypticism and somehow make it legitimate. The apocalypse actually severs once and for all the relationship of Jewish apocalyptic messianic expectation and eschatology from the messianic understanding realized in the resurrection and the eschatological presence of the resurrected one in his church now. The relationship between Jewish political, chronological, eschatological future is severed from the true Christian eschatological understanding that comes from the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the resurrected presence the presence of the resurrected one in our midst in the liturgy. Well, that's our completion of chapter 11 in the manual. We come to chapter 12 now. Uh, I, I need to hurry, I know, but I'm going to just stop here briefly. Uh, Get something to drink. We'll be right back and we'll be immediately then picking up on chapter 
12. I think in your notes it may say 11. If I didn't correct it, it'll of course be chapter 12. We'll be right back. Okay, welcome back. We take up now chapter 12 in your manual. We're taking up then the commentary on the second war, uh, the second apocalypse, the war against Rome. Uh, this chapter that we're going to look at, not the chapter in the apocalypse, but the chapter in our manual, chapter 12, we're going to deal with uh, some, some key passages. If we can get through it all, and I, I hope that we can, it would be nice to have it as a package because we're going to conclude with the identity of 666. And I know that that in and of itself sparks so much attention and that some have started the course with us way back in September, only wanting to know that and gave up ever getting there. So they, they may have abandoned us. So if at all possible, and we may take another break to get it all done, I would like to see, if at all possible, to get through the chapter. So let me get started then. As we have seen, the seventh seal of the first Jewish apocalypse seems to blend and overlap with the beginning of the second Jewish apocalypse. And in a sense, the two overlap like two pieces of cloth that they may be sewn together. But nevertheless, it is quickly obvious the tone as well as the content changes now. It's dramatically different. According to the Jewish scholars, the second Jewish apocalypse in a more far more powerful has a far more powerful and expressive intense hatred of Rome. The Babylonic destroyer of Judea. It is the second Jewish apocalypse or the series of apocalypses written during the siege and after the destruction of Jerusalem. When pieced together, the second Jewish apocalypse contained in Revelation 10, 10 through what, 11, 13, found in 12, 1 through 13, 8, and found in 14, 6, all the way through 22, 6. And as we did in the first apocalypse, Jewish apocalypse, let us now listen to the Jewish understanding of the second apocalypse found inside the apocalypse of John. In this context, the Jewish scholars will talk about this part and that part even more so than in the last part. And it is not easy to keep track of the various Christian insertions they refer to that they omit. In order to appreciate this original Jewish apocalyptic document that is being used by the Apostle John for his anti-apocalyptic purpose, we shall just simply follow the sequence discussed by the Jewish scholars rather than trying to insert them back and forth all the way through uh, John's apocalypse. So we would start with John, uh, the apocalypse, Revelation chapter 10, 1 through, 1 through 11. Again, if you're t watching this on tape, you can take time out and read it. The Jewish comment is very short. After the manner of Ezekiel chapter 2, the writer represents his vision 
as having been received in the form of a book, which he is to eat with its bitter contents. And then you begin with Revelation chapter 11, 1 through 13. And then the Jewish commentators remark, in imitation of Ezekiel 40 and Zechariah 2, the angel gives him a measuring rod that he may measure the site of the temple and the altar, which is to remain intact while the rest of the holy city is doomed to be trodden underfoot by the Gentiles, which is the Roman soldiers for 42 months. And you could refer back to Daniel chapter 7, Daniel chapter 8, and Daniel chapter 12, verse 7. He is then told that during this time there shall be two prophets, witnesses of the Lord, both Moses and Elijah, who shall again manifest their power of restraining the heavens from rain, of turning water into blood, of striking the land with plagues, as in Exodus 7. And whosoever shall attempt to hurt them will be devoured by fire from their mouths. Second Kings. Second Kings, that's probably our fourth kingdoms. I should have checked that one. It, I have the note, fourth Kings. But they will finally fall victims to the beast that ascends out of the abyss to make war. These two prophets, representing Elijah and Moses, will fall victims to the beast that ascends out of the abyss to make war upon them after their dead bodies have been lying for three and a half days in the streets of the holy city, which shall have become a Sodom and Gomorrah, and the people of all tongues and nations have looked upon them and rejoiced at the death of the prophets that had chastised them by their preaching of repentance, refusing to give them burial. God's Spirit will again imbue them with life, and they will, to the astonishment of the people, rise and ascend to heaven, and in the same hour, a great earthquake will cause the death of 7,000 people. Of this eschatological feature, no trace is found in the Jewish rabbinical sources except the appearance of Moses and the Messiah during the War of Gog and Magog. You can consult the Targum there on the book of Exodus. Possibly this is the older form of the legend of the Messiah, Ben Ephraim or Ben Joseph, being slain by Gog and Magog, based on Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10, with the citations there. We then come to chapter 12, the woman, her child, and the dragon in the book of Revelation, which would be 12, 1 and 12 through 12, 6. The Jewish comment, William Busset sees Zion in the garb of a woman, clothed with the sun, the moon beneath her feet, and the 12 stars on the crown of her head, while about to give birth to a child destined to rule all nations with a rod of iron, reference Psalm chapter 2, sued by a seven-headed dragon, the child, the future Jewish Messiah, is carried up to the throne of God, that is, he is hidden, and she, the mother, flees to the wilderness, where a place is prepared for her by God to be nourished in her, 
for three and a half years, and you can compare all this to Revelation 11.3, 13.5, Daniel 8.8, 8, and Daniel 11.25. This follows then in Revelation 12.7 through 12.10, the battle in heaven. And you can, according to our Jewish friends, compare with this account the Talmudic legend of the Messiah babe carried off by the storm. The Jewish citations are included. Here follows a similar story from another hand, telling of a battle raging in heaven between Michael, the synagogue, which means pleading angel of Israel. You can see the Midrash that's referenced there. A war between Michael and Satan, the Katagor, the accuser, which ends in the casting down of the old serpent with his host. A victory brought about by the merit of the Jewish martyrs, which silenced the accuser. It's all there. This brings us to chapter 12, verse 11. 11 through 17, about the dragon in the war with the woman. The Jewish commentary continues. It was thereafter, says this second version, that the woman, excuse me, Israel, was pursued by the serpent, but she was carried by a great eagle into a safe place in the wilderness, where she was nourished for a time, two times and a half. That's three and a half years compared to Daniel chapter 7. And when the dragon cast forth a flood of water to drown her, the earth opened her mouth to swallow the water. Finally, unable to slay the woman with her Messiah babe, the dragon made war with the remnant of her seed, the pious ones, who observed the commandments of God, omitting from the phrase, and having the testimony of Jesus Christ, which is judged a Christian insertion. But let me offer a Christian comment. Many people think that this is Mary, the woman hiding in the wilderness, who gave birth to Jesus. This is especially true of the Roman Catholic Church, who cites this passage in their feast honoring Mary, However, the woman in the story is not Mary. She is or represents the Old Testament people of God, ancient Israel. The crown of 12 stars are the 12 tribes of Israel. The child is the Jewish Christ, who is an offspring of ancient Israel. And the dragon is Satan. And comments it. Jeannie Costanino made when she spoke here at our retreat several years ago now at St. Elijah. She continued in her comment that the war in heaven is a flashback to the fall of Satan from heaven. Lucifer rebelled against God and took one third of the angels with him. This story is hinted at in the Bible, but it is not told. It occurs before time, before creation, before Satan appears in paradise. You can find this in Isaiah 14, 12, and Luke chapter 10, 18, where Luke is quoting Jesus. I was watching Satan fall from heaven like lightning. For John the Apostle, it is Satan who is fighting the church, not Rome fighting Israel, the nation of Judea. Let us make a Western cultural comment, or let the West make its own comment. The account of the war in heaven summarized in Revelation 12, 7 through 9, about the war in heaven we've already looked at, became cemented, this image of the war in heaven got cemented in Western culture in John Milton's poem, Paradise Lost. The well-known passage cited below depicts Satan after he has been cast out of heaven 
and accepts hell as his own kingdom. John Milton's from Paradise Lost. Is this the region, this the soil, this the clime? said then the lost archangel. This the seat that we must change for heaven. This mournful gloom for that celestial light. Be it so, since he who now is sovereign can dispose and bid what shall be right. Farthest from him is best whom reason has equaled, force has now made supreme above his equals. Farewell, happy fields, where joy forever dwells. Hail, horrors, hail, infernal world, and thou profoundest hell, receive thy new possessor, one who brings a mind not to be changed by place or time. For the mind is its own place and in itself can make a heaven of hell and a hell of heaven. What matter where if I be still the same and what I should be all but less than he whom thunder has made greater, here at least we shall be free. The Almighty hath not built here, for his envy he will not drive us hence. Here we may reign supreme, and in my choice to reign is worth ambition, though in hell. Better to reign in hell than serve in heaven. Chilling lines as Milton pondered Satan's being kicked out of heaven. Well, our comment would be that from the perspective of the Jewish commentators that we've looked at, where they are going to say that all of this is a Christian insertion. We can just remove the speculation and continue on. The second apocalypse in its war against Rome, we come to chapter 13 now. The Jewish comments on chapter 13 in order to understand the relationship between the prophecy concerning the beast and Rome and the vision of the dragon and the Messiah, the Christian lamb, which precede and follow, it is necessary to bear in mind this is the Jewish commentators speaking, that since the days of Pompey, the Roman general, Rome was in the eyes of Jewish apocalyptic writers, the fourth beast in the Daniel apocalypse of Daniel 8. Rome is the last wicked kingdom whose end is to usher in the Messianic kingdom in Canticles 2, Genesis, Leviticus, Midrash, and so forth, the Jewish citations given. Rome was found to be alluded to in Psalm 80, and in the words that are there in Hebrew, the boar out of the wood, the letter being written in Hebrew, raised above the line, making you see the word Rome spelled out. The identification of Rome with Babylon is found also in the Jewish Sibyllines. The identification with Tyre in Exodus, facts which indicate the lines of Jewish 
apocalyptic tradition. The wild beast of the reeds would be found in Psalm 68. It's also been identified with Rome, etc. But in order to account for the delay of the Messiah prophesied in these apocalypse, who was to slay the wicked by the mouth of his mouth, mouth in Isaiah 11, a cosmic power in the shape of an Aramanic, uh, a Persian uh, Darth Vader, uh, the Lord of Darkness and Chaos, inside of Zoroasterism and Zoranism. The dragon was introduced as the arch enemy plotting the destruction of the Messiah, the Antichrist who, with his host, hinders the redemption, and I can't pronounce all that Hebrew that they give, so the Jewish apocalypse has included now this Lord of Darkness out of the religion from Iran. And then they make and introduce a chapter 13 to us. And chapter 13 is chapter 13, verse 1 through 10 after which there is a break. To this end, the author used a mythological story borrowed from Babylonia and his citations for whether it was borrowed from uh, Babylonia or from Egypt or from the Greeks are debated by different scholars. Then after that little aside comment, the Jewish commentators take up chapter 13, 11 through 18. Verse 18. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. His number is six. Six, six. First of all, Jewish comments. The prophecy concerning Rome seems to have received many interpolations and alterations at the hand of Jewish and Christian compilers. Both the second beast, the false prophet who aids in the worship of the image of the emperor and the interpretation of the seven heads, Romans, uh, Revelation 17, 8 through 11, are later insertions. The number 666, and there's Hebrew given there, also is scarcely genuine inasmuch as the number 256 represents both the beast and the man, the words beast and man. For the second beast, called Beliar, you could see the Sibyllines and the references are there. Our comments. Seven heads of the beast. This is found there in... 13, 13. Well, I don't see it right there. I apologize to you, but the seven heads that are referred to in it. The first head of the beast is Caesar Augustus. He is the founder of the Roman Empire. The, concept was created by Julius Caesar. He's assassinated. Augustus is the first implementer of the empire. Tiberius succeeds him and becomes the second head. Caligula, the third, 
Claudius, who we mentioned several times, is the fourth head. Nero is the fifth head. These are the five fallen dead kings of the first group of emperors, those from the Julius Caesar, Claudian, Augustus line. And then there were two more at this point when this part of the apocalypse was written. There was Vespasian, who followed Nero and was uh, emperor when the city of Rome was sacked, and Titus, uh, who had conquered Jerusalem and became emperor. The seven heads of Revelation chapter 13 represent the seven Roman emperors from Augustus to T Titus. This indicates when the Jewish apocalypse was written. It was written during the reign of Titus, 79 through 81. We shall have more to say about these seven heads when commenting on later chapters in the apocalypse. The worship of the beast, of course, refers to the establishment of the emperor cult. It was the worship of and allegiance to the emperor that tied all the various countries and ethnic nations and populations within the Roman Empire together. Other than brute force, there was no other glue holding the Roman Empire together. Well, our comments. The reference in Revelation 13, 3, to one of the seven heads being mortally wounded is an historical reference to Nero. Nero was and remains to this day a spe of special historical significance to both Jews and Christians. The first persecution of Jews and Jewish Christians began with Nero. He burned Rome in 64 AD. The Roman historian Tacitus reported consequently to get rid of the report which had accused Nero of setting fire to the city of Rome. Nero fastened the guilt and inflicted the most exquisite tortures on a class hated for their abominations called Christians by the populace. Accordingly, an arrest was first made of all who pleaded guilty. Then upon their information, an immense multitude was convicted, not so much the crime of firing the city, setting it on fire, as hatred against mankind. Mockery of every sort was added to the death of these Christians, covered with the skins of slaughtered beasts. They were torn by dogs and perished, or were nailed to crosses, or doomed to be set a flame and burnt to serve as a nightly illumination when daylight had expired. Nero had them tied to poles, covered with tar, and Christian Jews were set on fire to be his tiki torches at night. Nero offered his gardens for the spectacle. 
and was exhibiting a show in the circus while he mingled with the people in the dress of a charioteer, a charioteer or stood aloft on a car. Hence, even for criminals who deserve extreme and exemplary punishment, there arose a feeling of compassion, for it was not as it seemed for the public good, but to glut one man's cruelty that these Christians were being destroyed. Also in 64 AD, Nero martyred 977 Christians, the most famous of them, the 977, being Peter and Paul. The names of the other 975 champions are known only to God. Paul, being a Roman citizen, was beheaded. Peter, according to tradition, was crucified upside down. The first Jewish war began during his reign in 66 AD. He sent the Roman general Vespasian to Palestine, where he began the siege of Jerusalem. Nero committed suicide on June the 9th, 68 AD. He died without a successor, and his death ended the julio claudian claudian dynasty, and Rome entered a period of civil war known as the Years of the Four Emperors, which lasted 12 months. Roman General Vespasian, who had begun the siege of Jerusalem, returned to Rome and was named emperor in 69. Vespasian left his son Titus in charge in Palestine. Titus will sack Jerusalem and destroy the Jewish temple in 70 AD. The Arch of Titus in Rome commemorates his victory over the Jews. The head mortally wounded refers to Nero committing suicide in 68 AD. Well, we took one little break a while ago, and since we're going just a little bit longer than normal, let's stop right here before we make any more comments, and we'll take one more brief break before we're able to finish up the rest of our chapter. We'll be right back. Thanks. Well, welcome back after that brief break. Some comments on... Revelation 13, 9, and 10. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. He who leads into captivity shall go into captivity. He who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. Jewish apocalyptic messianic nationalism had destroyed Jerusalem and the temple. John's apocalypse, written 20 to 25 years later, has made use of Jewish apocalyptic messianic documents not only to demonstrate the folly of Jewish apocalypticism, but also to demonstrate to the churches that Christian apocalypticism was just as foolish and erroneous. He who is the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, out of his mouth 
a sharp two-edged sword goes. Revelation 1, 16, remember? His words cut both ways. It is apocalypticism. He who is the Alpha and the Omega severs both Jewish and Christian. The original tone of the apocalyptic document, he who leads into captivity shall go into captivity. He who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword was against Rome, which had carried Jews and Jewish artifacts captive to Rome as depicted on the Arch of Titus in Rome. We have those pictures there, pictures in your manuscript. Those who carry others into captivity shall themselves be carried into captivity. However, he who has the sharp double edges in his mouth with one edge cuts against the Jews who had rebelled against Rome in the first place. They had taken up the sword. They died by the sword. They would have captured the Romans. They themselves were taken captive by the Romans. The second edge of that two-edged sword cuts against Christian Jews who brought their nationalistic messianic apocalypticism with them into the church. Christians who engage in apocalyptic rebellion will suffer the same fate. Those who kill with the sword must be killed with the sword. Not only the identity of the Messiah that is, what kind of Messiah he will be is at stake, but also the identity of God is at stake. Is Caesar God, or is Jesus Christ God? That is a question of identity. The God of apocalypticism is the angry God of the Jews, the God who revealed himself by becoming flesh and dwelling among us is not an angry God. He came not to condemn, but to rescue, that we might have life and have it in abundance. The God who revealed himself in the incarnation is not the God of apocalypticism. Buried in the middle of the apocalypse is this double-edged warning against the self-righteous, vindictive anger of apocalypticism. Your figure 49, which is on the inside of the arch, on its side panels and going interior, is a detail where you see the Population, the Romans carrying off the treasures from the temple. And you see the candlestick, the menorah of the Jews carried off. And figure 50 is a photograph as well of the Arch of Triumph. It is a huge arch there in the city of Rome, still there today. Well, our comments then on the beast of the earth. The beast of the sea in Revelations 13, 1 is followed by the beast of the earth in 13, 11. I saw another beast which arose out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb, spoke like a dragon. It exercises all the authority of the first beast in its presence and makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast whose mortal wound was healed. 
The beast of the earth, the land, are the Roman governors and provinces of Asia, modern-day Turkey, as well as all the other provinces of the Roman Empire. You have there a diagram of the provinces of the Roman Empire that were ruled by governors or other titles that they would have. The Roman governors, by whatever title they ruled in these provinces, exercised the authority of the emperor, the imperium. They exercised all the authority in the name of the emperor. They made sure everyone worshipped the emperor. The worship of the emperor increasingly was embraced as the glue uniting the far-flung empire whose parts had already, whose parts had hardly any relationship with one another. The worship of the emperor originating in the east had spread westward, eventually reaching Britain. It is obviously well outside this present work to explore this westward expansion of emperor worship across the Roman Empire. And sometimes Western scholars only speak of emperor worship in the eastern end, uh, most of us being caught by surprise that it was in France and even in England as well. However, the fact that it spread westward and that it spread westward as an implementation of Roman policy rather than already culturally being present as it was in the East testifies to the importance and necessity of emperor worship as the glue holding the empire together. I've got a, a long passage there from a, a well-known uh, historical scholar of the 20th century uh, making and discussing the creation of uh, the cult of the Roman emperor through the uh, artifacts and uh, archaeological digs that have been found to, be, to give us the evidence of it, to indicate the deliberate Romanization of these regions. And this author, historian Fishwick, his purpose was to assess the significance of the imperial cult in Britain in the light of Roman religious policies in other Roman provinces as well. He goes on to link to go over that, and in the essence of time, I'm going to skip over these several pages that discuss the implementation of the imperial cult, emperor worship in Britain. Uh, the long passage that's going to be quoted. And so let me turn then, you will find it under the heading, our comments, the beast of the earth and the mark of the beast. In other words, in all that material we just skipped, the beast of the sea, which is the empire and the emperor, and the beast, the beast of the earth, the imperial cult centers with their imperial officials and imperial cult priests were for all intents and purposes one beast, the mark, the singular identity shared by empire, emperor, priest, imperial officials, and the populations alike was the singular identity 666. 
In the same way, Adolf Hitler was the Third Reich, and the Third Reich was Adolf Hitler, and the Sieg Heil, victory salute, united the Reich, Hitler and the German people together into a singular whole with a singular identity and a singular purpose, that hail to victory salute. Now I know that was a ethnic group, but in the same way that Heil Hitler, Sieg Heil, became the symbol of Hitler, the Reich, and the people. Ein Reich, uh, ein Volk, ein Führer. Uh, one government, one rule, one kingdom rather, one people, one leader, oneness in that Sig Heil statement. What the Sig Heil shout was to the Nazis, metaphorically the 666 was to Rome even as Sig Heil is forever associated with Adolf Hitler, likewise the 666 of Rome was forever associated with one man, Nero. Well, Jewish mysticism, neither Greek nor Hebrew Languages have numbers. Letters are used to be the numbers. There is a discipline within Jewish mysticism known as the gematria that is devoted to finding hidden meanings in the numerical values of words. For example, the number 18 is very significant because it is the numerical value of the Hebrew word kai, meaning life or living. Donations to Jewish charities are routinely made in denominations, 18, 36, 72, for that very reason. In Greek, the practice of adding up the numerical value of the letters of a name or word is called isosephi, isophacy. From isos equals and cephos pebbles, which means this word equals the sum of the pebbles of the letters. Nero, then, within first century Judaism, Nero had burned Rome and blamed it on a Jewish sect, the Christians. It was therefore Nero who began the first imperial persecution of the Jews. In response to this persecution, the apocalyptic Jews began a revolt against Rome, which launched the first Jewish-Roman War two years later, in 66 AD, a war that would result in the death of over one million Jews in four years, and the destruction of both Jerusalem and the Jewish Temple in 70 AD. Nero thus became the face of the beast at the time these Jewish apocalypses is being, are being written. The isophosophy, I can't say the word, the value of Nero Caesar when written in Hebrew is 666. In the Greek language, Nero 
ended with an N, and the consonants, which is what Hebrew has, would be N R W N, the W being the O. The N is the noon in Hebrew, it equals 50. The R is resh, it means 200. The vav, the double, excuse me, w equals 6. And the nun, the n again, is 50. That adds up to 306. Nero equals 306. And Caesar becomes the cough for 100. The Samech, the S for 60. The R, again, the Resh for 200. That equals 360 plus 306. You get 300, you get 666. You add up the letters for Neron and Kaisar, you get 666. We have there a picture of the bust of the beast, 666. But there is further evidence that 666 equals Nero. Not every ancient manuscript or part of the book of Revelation or chapter 13 has the number of the beast as 666. You're going, what? They have the number as 616. The number of the beast is not 666. These copies of Revelation have the number as 616. And you're going, what? What? I, I, you, you're in a panic, particularly if you're a sola scripturist. Believe it or not, the fact that they have 616 also establishes the name of the beast to be Nero. Now hang on. As early as the second century, Saint Irenaeus had heard of manuscripts of the book of Revelation that said the number was 616. So th no, this is not an invention. And after saying he did not know how such an error could have been made, he said, I am inclined to think that this occurred through the fault of the copyist, as is wont to happen, since numbers also are expressed by letters, so that the Greek letters that express the number 60 was easily expanded into the letter iota of the Greeks becoming a, a one instead of the six. You should have there also a picture of one of the fragments that says 616. Irenaeus supported 666 as correct, but he also knew there were some manuscripts that said 616. And through the centuries, other manuscripts have been discovered which also have the number as 666, and I've got them listed for you there. Even some of the earliest manuscripts. Now, the earliest manuscript just means that the copies we found, that's the page material is the oldest, 
but it doesn't mean it was uh, the, the most the, the oldest copy of that book found. It's just the oldest piece of paper that had been found. All original biblical manuscripts are non-existent. We don't have the autograph. As they were held and copied onto new materials, eventually the originals fell apart, leaving fragments for a period and then only the copies. So the oldest materials might be among the newest copies. If that 666 was written on a material that lasted a long time, and the 616 was written on a material that wore out quickly, the new copy of 616 would have been made quickly before the other copy, 666, had worn out. And so the copy of the 616 would be older than the 666, even though the original 666 was the oldest to begin with. Well, how can 616 and 666 both equal Nero? We have used the value for the name Nero, Caesar in Greek, and found its value when transliterated into Hebrew to be 666. Consider for a moment that at some point the various Greek documents which became the New Testament were separately and independently translated into Latin prior to any codification of a New Testament about after some 400, 396 AD. In the 666, if the 666 in the manuscripts was understood to equal Nero Caesar, the translator from Greek would have calculated the Latin way of writing Nero Caesar when translating into Latin. For example, in Greek, Nero was Neron. However, in Latin, Nero was simply N-R-O, Nero, to be converted into the Hebrew consonants, which would have been N-R-W, Nero, 256. The Kaisar, C-S-R, would be equal to 360. And when you add 360 with 256, you get 616. Therefore, the Latin translations, knowing the reference in the Jewish apocalyptic documents was to Nero, converted the number from the Greek 666 to the Latin 616 so that the Greek version and the Latin version both signify Nero. In other words, Nero is the issue, not the number 666 or 616. They both point to the same beast, to the same empire, to the same emperor, to the same Sigheil. Nero, in Jewish apocalyptic thought, in waging war against Jerusalem and destroying the temple, had pitted the all-encompassing Roman Empire against the all-encompassing Jewish Messianic Kingdom of God. In Jewish terms, Nero and his number, whether 666 or 616, was now the marker, the logo, for an anti-Messiah, 
and his anti-Messianic kingdom. There could be and would be many embodiments of Nero, many more emperors, each and all acting as anti-Messiahs and anti-Christ. All across the world for the last 2,000 years, empires have come and gone. And depending on your view of that empire, it is possible to have judged every empire to have been a beast and all guilty of being a 666. Well, we got all of that in today by the grace of God and your graciousness to let me kind of cut and omit a few passages along the way to get us here today. Next Monday, God willing, we will meet again and we should finish up all of part two, the history within the apocalypse. We hope to finish then uh, the book of uh, the Jewish part through Revelation chapter 22. We will then be off for Christmas. We will not meet on the 28th, nor will we meet on, I think it's the 3rd or 4th, rather, of January, since that would be our first Monday back after the new year on the weekend. We will come back then for part three, the mystagogic apocalypse, beginning then on January the 11th, and we will see where the, that part of our study takes us and how many more sessions we will have together. So thank you for being part of us. So many of you have written for copies of the material that we've made available, uh, and it's been hard for me to keep up with whether you're a new one, and I've not said hello to you, and I apologize for that. And for those that have written and made so many comments regarding this class and the other classes, your comments are quite humbling, and uh, just a, 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 reminder, a reminder that uh, God can use just this little bitty light. He could use Balaam's donkey, uh, and he could certainly make use of our little study going on here at St. Elijah. So God bless you, and I look forward to seeing you next week. Stay safe. God willing, we'll all be safe. We'll see each other next week. Bye-bye.